Romans chapter 8, verse 35. Before we read, just go to, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Your word, Lord, is always the inerrant word. Your word is suitable for correcting our perspective, our thoughts, our attitudes. Your word is the word that gives life. And show us where life comes from. Your word is the one that nourishes us, teaches us and guides us into the truth and the absolute truth. So even we just read and just ponder upon this word, may you speak to each one of us individually in a specific way. We pray all of this in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. We are at Romans chapter 8, verse 35. I'm going to do a few things. I'm going to first read it to you. Slowly, you follow along. And I'm going to give you a few minutes to meditate upon that. And then, for you to read it together with me again, slowly one more time. Romans 8, 35 says, Who shall separate us from the love of of Christ shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written for your sake we face death all day long we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered verse 37 says no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present or the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. I'm going to read to you again one more time instead of asking you all to read on your own. And I want you, you to catch words that is highlighted to you. And one of the words I want you to look out for is about the love of God or the love of Christ. So follow me as I read again. It says from the very verse 35, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? And then it goes to say, Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword. And then in verse 37, it clearly says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who love Asked. That's the second part where you see the word of God saying the love of Christ and then through him who loved us. And I'm convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels or demons, neither the present or the future or any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God. That's the third one that is in Christ. Jesus. Let me share with you some thoughts. And I think it's important for you to take that thoughts. Very often in our life, your life and my life, we think about what can separate us from the love of God. And straight away, we read this part here, we think about danger, we think about problems, hardship, we think about sickness, and these are the things we think that can separate us or will be the things that separate us. And often it is. You see a Christian, you see a believer, good times, love God, but tough times, give up on God and everything and all that. And it often happens because we miss certain aspects. Because we are responding to God's love based upon our love. Actually, if you read this passage carefully, which I did as my devotion, who shall separate us from the love of God? 
the primary source, the very beginning, the very first part of it all is that God loved us first. And no, nothing, actually, when you read this passage carefully, nothing can separate, or I put it in our language, nothing can stop God from loving us. Nothing. It depends, of course, on your response also. But the point is that nothing can stop God's love for us. That is why, if you read carefully this part, it talks about salvation. It talks about Christ dying on the cross for us. That's the context of the passage. That is the first extreme, and I said it's always the backdrop that God first loved us. And nothing can take that away. Do we realize that? Do we realize that? As I thought about this passage and I was imagining it, I want to share with you an experience that happened to Molly and myself. We play pickleball in the morning, so one of the morning, we went by. We went by, uh, going home. And typically, I walk ahead first, I'm first, and I just walk ahead. I didn't see anything, I was walking towards the car, and she was just trailing from behind, and walking along the same pathway that I was walking. And she saw, as she was walking, a little bird that was on the floor on the pathway. She picks it up and she saw that the bird was all around the bird was attacked by ants. The ants were just attacking bird like that, and she just brushed it off and everything, she brushed it off and all that. And thinking that that's it and everything. But somehow she has decided in her heart that she wants to nurse the bird. She wants to nurse the bird. So she walked along now, I wasn't there, so she tells me this part of it, and I knew what really has happened. And then she said she felt ants biting her hands. And then she looked at it. Underneath the wing of the birds are ants. There were still ants besides on the surface that were still attacking the bird. So she brushed it off, and then she came to the car. And in my heart, she said she wanted to take it home, and I was thinking, let's not do that now. Because when I was, once we, we saw a little bird, we took that bird and we tried to nurse the bird to the best we can. In fact, I thought I, that time we did the best. We put the bird in a little bucket with cloth and everything and we hung it by a papaya tree near my house there. Outside thinking that that's nature and everything, the bird will do well. The next day, the bird froze to death. Obviously froze to death. Died. Very broken hearted for me. I... I can't say for others, but for myself, I was very broken hearted about that. You try your best, and it died. So this second one, I was a little bit reluctant about that, but since she brought it home, we brought home the first night. Now, I may not have the story absolutely accurate in the days, but it goes along this way. I just want you to catch the trend. I remember that I put it into a basket. We put a towel to keep it warm overnight. She fed the bird. You know, baby birds don't eat. Don't, I don't know how the mother feed and everything like that. So she tried to feed milk and everything. It won't open the beak. And we tried, tried, tried. One or two times, it opened its beak. And we fed it. And then at night, we just left it there. We debated. Lo and behold, the next morning when we woke up, the bird was still alive. And I said, hey, this is good, man. So she is very excited. She go and look for milk and she must go and look for the high class protein milk to feed the bird. I got pictures of it. I got pictures. I don't know why. Something prompted me to take pictures of everything of it. And she got the feed, fed it and everything and all that. And second night, lo and behold, it survived the second night. The third day she fed and the bird just jumped down. Jump down from the basket there, we take, we put it back, and I'm showing that it was getting a little bit stronger. And I think it was on the third day, she fed the bird, and then the bird flew away to a tree. Flew to a tree. And then I saw her stand down there on the ledge down there, looking, and the tree was just across our balcony there. She just stand down there. One of the most pathetic sights. Uh. 
You know, some there like so sad, so broken hearted like that. And I knew she was kind of broken hearted and the bird has flew there and everything. So we kind of said that's the end of the story. We have nursed the bird, we have saved it and everything, all that, that's the best we can do. I mean, what else can you? Of course, in the heart, and I know in her heart and in my heart, although I didn't express it, is that how nice it would be if the bird comes back to me and be our bird. But we didn't want to do that because it's supposed to be a freedom. And anyway, God is freedom. We flew there. There's no way we can catch it back and everything. So we pack up the milk. We pack up the basket. We pack up everything. And we had, I think, lunch or something. And lunchtime, it flew back. It flew back to the ledge and you could see the excitement on her face. Of course, I was excited and said, Hey, where's the milk? Where's the thing? And Where's the spoon? And everything. And we fed the bird again and everything. And that was so wonderful and everything. But again, the bird flew off. So we thought maybe dinner time will come back. Uh. Never come back. Next day, never come back. Two, three days else, never come back. Let me tell you why I tell you this story. Very often we forget that it is God longing for us, loving us, you know, and that He doesn't want anything to separate us. Eventually, when I thought of a name for the bird, I call it redeemed. From the word redemption, redeem. The reason is because the bird is meant to have been dead. Attacked by the ants and everything. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying Molly is God. Everything is meant to die and everything, but it did not die because there was Molly who took it up. And then redeem already brought to life. And then had the freedom to fly away. And return once, but never anymore. Who can separate us from the love of God? As I meditate upon that, very often it is not hardship, very often it's not death, very often it's not life, but I tell you who separates us from God? Ourselves. Ourselves. You know, God is like Molly on that day. Saved us that we might remain in Him and have the best joy, the greatest pleasure for Himself. God will have pleasure when we are with Him. And He wants to give us the best. And He has proven it by saving us. But very often we think that we are safe, once safe, always safe, we are happy and we go out and we take our freedom and we live according to our own ways. Who separate us from God? The bird flew away, never came back. Molly didn't chase the bird away, neither anything at all. The bird just flew away, it never came back. Maybe it gained its freedom, maybe it found new found things, I do not know and everything, and that's not important. But the important point is I got three photographs of Molly standing by the ledge there with a yearning face and a groaning heart, waiting, hoping for the bird to return. And the joy I could imagine would be even greater than the first time when it returned. How is your relationship with God? Is the question I ask. Do we realize that God's love for us is so great that nothing can separate Him from loving us? Nothing should be able to separate us from loving Him but except for one thing, our freedom, our salvation, that we would run away and never return. So I ask a question, how often do you do your quiet time? How often do you take time to spend with God? And if you don't or you seldom do it, or if you do it just dutifully, I want you to capture this picture that God is not just saying, do something for me. God is longing for us. Who shall Separate us. And that's why it says, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. 
if we maintain this close relationship, this intimate relationship with God, we will be more than conquerors. Death, pains, disappointment, life itself and everything will never be able to distract us. We get distracted because of our relationship with God. So think about it for a little while. Think about not yourself, coming from yourself, I love God, I got to do my devotion, I got to spend time with God. That's the wrong way. Think of God sitting there, yearning for you, waiting for you, having saved you, having given you your salvation, having given you your freedom, having given you everything that you have, that you can be more than conquerors. And there He sits, not wanting to catch you with a trap or anything, yearning, longing, my daughter, my son, would you, Come into my presence. As I read that, I turned to Psalms 63. Turn with me. I can't give you three points or anything like that because this is an impromptu thing that I'm just sharing with you. Psalm 63. It says the psalmist writes, and this is David, he writes, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. That's the first thing we must ask ourselves. You seek God? Most of us do. Is he our God? Yes, he is. But the key word there is earnestly. I seek you. Are you earnest in seeking God as earnestly as God longed for you in His presence? Earnestly I seek you. Then it says, My soul thirsts for you. It is interesting. Your soul will thirst for God only if your body, which is the next line, and some version says, My flesh longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. Of course, David was describing a desert. He's in the desert and there is no water and there is nothing at all. His body is in such a state that he is dying and there is an oasis there. And he just wants to get there. My flesh longs. For that water. Is that the extent we long for God in our life? How much do you long for God? I love God. I long for Him. But when it comes to say, earnestly I seek you, my body, my soul thirsts for you. You know, our soul can never thirst for God because it is already put there a thirst for God. It must respond in a sense of earnestly to go there. You, your soul has a thirst for God. That is why we are never satisfied where we are. If we are satisfied spiritually where we are, we are in trouble. But when there is no satisfaction, there is that longing and that longing, then you must remember God also longed for it. And what I'm trying to tell you is that it can be fulfilled. It can be fulfilled. That's all I want to share with you. And the question I left for myself when I did this devotion is, how much do I long for God? Do I long for Him enough So even death will not separate me from him. Do I long for him enough? So much so that even life, a good life, will not separate me from him. Do I long for him that even it takes hardship and I will have to face hardship, but Lord, my eyes will be upon you. 
and you alone? Or do I just long for you, Lord, enough to say that I'm a Christian or I'm a better Christian than another one? You see, the reality that comes down to me and I learn from this passage is that your relationship with God is the utmost thing. It's not performance, it's not doing, it's not anything, it's not events. It described in John here all the events about it. So just to end here, number one, God longs for you. Don't get it wrong. The starting point, understand we have a loving God and an almighty God who has saved you, who has shown you, as it's written here by the psalmist, that in your sanctuary I've seen your power, I've seen your glory. And most of us have done that in our life. We have seen God come through for us. All of that. But the point still remains of going back to the presence of God. That is why the Hebrews understand, I've preached this before, I've shared it to you before, that they cry out to God, they say, if you will not go with us, we will not go at all. When God promised to send an angel with them, when God promised to give them victory, when God promised them land, that is more than ever and everything. But the answer, Lord, if you will not go with us, we will not depart. We need to capture that. We need to capture that. I thank God that it is His love for us that nothing can separate us from Him. His outpouring love and everything. But my prayer for you and for me is to respond in the appropriate way. That Lord, I will earnestly seek you. As my flesh, when I am so thirsty, I'm in a desert, and it, my only lifeline is that Lord, when I come to that point, Lord, let me have that yearning, let me have that longing. So maybe you should reflect also, what is your longing for God? What is your spiritual longing for God? For one year, I've been walking with three other persons. And one of the things that I discovered that I have a spiritual longing. And that spiritual longing, if I want to put it in terms into a word or into a simple phrase, is this. I like, I see myself in a boat buffeted by storms and the boat is just going up and down up and down water is coming in and the storm is coming and all that and there I am busy trying to get rid of everything and everything water and everything just to keep calm and my heart is so in turmoil my heart is so troubled because I see the storm I see everything around me I see ministry as very challenging. I see ministering to people as very challenging. I see my, my own uh, 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 responsibility, even carrying out the responsibility, are very, very challenging. I see all that. Those are like the storms of my life. But you know what? In the midst of all this, I realized, long, I said, Lord, how nice it would be if I can find peace and tranquility in all of this storm. And it brought me to the passage where the disciples were caught in the storm and they were so busy up there. And what was Jesus doing? Sleeping below. Sleeping below. And why is he sleeping below? Because none of the disciples ever thought of going into his presence until they went into his presence, called him, only did the peace and the storm stopped. Again, the peace and the tranquility comes with an intimacy or with a close relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
He can be in your boat. Yes, you are Christian. He's in your boat. But is he the captain of your boat? Or are you the captain of the boat? Let us pray. Take a few moments to consider what I have shared. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress and I will never be shaken. My soul finds rest in God alone. My salvation comes from Him. He alone is my rock and my salvation. He is my fortress. I will never be forsaken. Psalm 62 verses 1 and 2 will be a reality when we practice what is in Psalm 63. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld the power of your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with the riches of food. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. On my bed, I will remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. Because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Father, these are the longing of our heart. And we sometimes, Lord, try to fulfill that longing, Lord, by doing things for you. We sometimes try to fulfill the things, Lord, by finding pleasures in the world or to be easily distracted by the pleasure of the world. When all you want and all you call for us is to be in your presence. Thank you this afternoon, Lord, that you remind us you long for us more than we long for you. For reminding us your love is better than life. For reminding us that you first love us and that your love is so great that nothing can separate us, can separate us from you. Neither will you allow anything to separate you from us. May we respond in the right manner. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Would you stand with me in closing uh, appropriate song in response but let it be a very personal uh, 
uh, time with God. I think there is no need to rush. Uh, would you respond in your own way? Uh, truly be authentic before God. Yeah. There is a longing. There is a longing. Maybe even right now, you just want to articulate the desires upon your heart in a quiet moment, in your quiet way before our Lord God Almighty, who seeks you, who longs after you. So when you yourself know where you are, I just want you to commune and converse with God right now. Be just a little bit more word from the scripture to encourage you and that's what I've been meditating upon the word of God says David says you have searched me Lord and you know me the word says you know when I sit and when I rise you perceive my thoughts from afar Lord you discern my going out and my laying down you are familiar with all my ways David says, before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You help me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. He says, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. 
Sometimes we feel that we can hide away from God. But verse 7 says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there, your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light has become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. We can never hide from the presence of God. We can never think that we are too much in the darkness and God can't save you. So maybe I'm speaking, as the word says, to people who feel adrift and distant. May this be an encouragement to you, even from the furthest end of of the earth, the Lord's hand will hold you. His right hand will hold you fast. When you feel that you're going through, in fact, hardship, difficulties, may this word encourage you. That our Lord will hold you and hold you fast. Only let us be steadfast to the Lord. Let's sing just this song one last time in a closing as an affirmation of God's love in our hearts and let us respond to God and let us commit ourselves to God. There is a long way. a longing only you can fill arranging temples only you can fill my soul is thirsty Lord to know you as I know drink from the river that flows before your Deeper in love with you Jesus, hold me close in your embrace Take me deeper Deeper than I've ever been before I just want to love you more and more How I long To the promise of your grace My heart is calling you A hope that will run about To hear your presence Forever satisfied Take me deeper Deeper in love with you the song that we have sang encourages your heart and causes you to turn to God daily. Lord, thank you God for this time that we can have just to learn, just to sing and respond to you. Thank you God that I'm sure you have heard the desires of our heart. In the following week, Lord, please allow us to abide in you and you abide in us. 
so that we may bear fruits and shown ourselves, Lord, to be disciples of yours. Thank you, God, for this time. In Jesus' name that we all pray together. Amen. Please be seated.